We're beginning chapter 13 of The Ultimate Evil by Mari Terry. Another long one, guys. Strap in. In Death's Valley, it's a long trail of murders, and all that's gone down before is why we've come 3,000 miles to be here today. I said quietly, they're all dead. Raiden, Sisman, the Carr brothers, and more. And all were linked to this setup before they went down. In that context, the Raiden case wouldn't appear to be an isolated event. To one side, a file cabinet marked Hillside Strangler caught my eye. It was 11.15 a.m. on a sunny Monday, July 18, 1983. In the offices of Sheriff's Homicide in downtown Los Angeles' Hall of Justice, around a back room table, Detective Sergeants Carlos Avila and Willie Ahan listened and asked questions as we laid out the Raiden scenario as we knew it to be. The husky, tanned Ted Gunderson, conservatively dressed in the manner of his former profession, had placed his mini-recorder between us. Avelia and Ahan, who were working the Raiden case, looked long hand, took long-handed notes. We're aware that you didn't come all this way on a lark, Avelia said, smiling. It was five weeks after Raiden's body was found, and the 48-year-old investigator knew well that the probe was a difficult one. Tell us what you've got on this Manson too, or Frank, if that's his name. My prison people think he may have had a hand in this, and it makes and it makes sense that he would. He was their star shooter. He's from this area, and their so-called headquarters is supposed to be here too. Do you know where? Not exactly. I named the L.A. suburb Vinny had specified. That's a likely spot, Willie Ahan nodded. The dark-haired detective was middle-aged and of Asian descent. Lots of strange characters there. I think we want your help on all this as much as we hopefully can fill in a couple of blanks for you. At least in a background sense, I explained. For two hours, the various cases were discussed. The talks... The talk was of Hollywood films, drug deals of Ronald Sisman, Berkowitz of Christine Freund of Arliss Perry's killing up the coast at Stanford. So the NYPD never told you Raiden and Sisman were buddies? No, and were back. Th no, and we were back there too, Avelia replied. That doesn't surprise me. Well, Sisman was dealing coke, and the dope came from Columbia through the Miami area, and you've got Miami links in this case. I know there's a lot of coke out of Miami, but there may be a robin, a round robin. My prison people say the same cast of characters appear all over this picture in one way or another, and they haven't been shown to be wrong yet. You said there was heroin too, Willie Ahan asked. That may be somebody else's whom Raiden knew. Maybe some organized crime link. Hawaii. Sounds right. There's a lot of Asian heroin, Ahan answered. Ted pulled out a copy of Vinny's note on a Hawaiian operation and read off some addresses. Yeah, Ahan said. That hospital is real and so is that office complex. That's what I mean, I interjected. We've been dealing with confirmations up and down the line on this. I then gave the detectives a copy of Vinny's co coded jet set prison notes. These were written before Sisman's murder. I think you'll see a familiar name or two in there. Yes, Avelia nodded and passed the paper to Ahan. And he also saw a private photo of Raiden with some woman. He's her. Here's her description. I showed Avelia another letter. That's Raiden's ex, Tony Fillet. Avelia said that fits her perfectly. And he saw a personal photo. Yeah, I saw Fillet's picture last year. I didn't think he was talking about her because of his hair color. No, he's talking about her all right. Her hair comes out dark, but it's really blondish, like he says. 
Well, he also says Berkowitz was at Raiden's house once. Is that so? That's, inter uh, that's interesting, Ahan replied. We can't tell you who our suspects are, Avelia said, but there is a small circle of people in LA connected to this case, but we have no idea if any of them are in a cult. It probably doesn't matter as far as your case goes, Ted remarked. No, it really doesn't, Avelia answered. We've got to get somebody first and then worry about what their other connections may be. There's a snuff film in here somewhere. The soft-spoken Willie Ahan questioned. Somewhere, I said, but my people don't claim that's the only motive. And maybe they heard movies and assumed it was the snuff tape, but it was really the cotton club being referred to. That could be too. But look, you've got drugs and big bucks all over this thing, and that's just like back in New York. And so is blowing somebody's head off, its favorite M.O. of theirs. And it's the same crew of people, and while you can have drugs without a, a cult, you will not have a cult without drugs. I think they know that, Ted offered, with... What with Manson and all, you guys have seen your bizarre killings and cults. I don't know a lot about cults, but we do have them, Avelia said. These people do other things in the 9 to 5 world, I said, and we're into the executive suite here, not the lower levels. Raiden wasn't even in the Westchester cult itself, although some big money people are into this satanic stuff. We've already got links to Long Island money and Raiden dealt with the Westchester leaders and everybody did favors for everybody. I think we're suggesting, really, that there may have been a working alliance here like the informant said was set up in New York. Raiden might have known all about this headquarters here and about this Manson 2 guy, Ted remarked, but maybe not by name, Ahan agreed. All this sounds familiar, I said. Dope, big money, murder, and upper class links. We're just saying that when you look at suspects, you may very well be looking at cult connected people and this Manson too, or Frank, or whoever he is. But we don't know that yet, Avelia said. I know, but you've got notes from prison there that are really titillating, I'd say. Right, they're interesting. How long did Raiden know Bob Evans? He had a coke bust, didn't he? Yeah, he said. A few years ago, Avelia answered. He's, he supposedly didn't meet Raiden until earlier this year. Elaine Jacobs knew both of them, and she allegedly put them together. And she apparently didn't meet Raiden herself until earlier this year. Or Evans either. But she got an attorney and has refused to speak with us. So who says she didn't know Evans all that long? Evans? Yeah, I see. And who was this circle of people you mentioned? They were people Lanny Jacobs knew. Young guys? 30s? Some. Can you give us any names? No, we can't do that, Abelia said. Is it possible a couple of those people could have known Raiden or anybody else too? I asked. Sure, Willie Ahan nodded. Has anybody been cleared? Ted Gunderson asked. Not a one. We were playing a subtle game and we knew it. The police couldn't give up sensitive information on a very active investigation, nor did we expect them to. Our aim was to learn as much as we could to ascertain whether the cult shadow fell over the Raiden case. All the signs were there. Plus, Vinny's formal statement was made shortly before Raiden's death, and we hoped we might help the investigation by altering the detectives to the bigger picture. The police were very clear on their position. First, an arrest. Then they'd try to determine if cult connections existed. I wish I had more on this Manson, too, but it's just the description, a possible first name, and the fact that he was supposed to be in an L.A. suburb as of two years ago, I said. 
we assume he's still around because he lives in this area for years. He's lived in this area for years. But we've also got a Florida we've also got the Florida drug links with Raiden's friend Sisman and with Jacobs too, Ted said. Those are common those are common denominators, and so is the fact that Raiden was wasted that the headquarters is here and that letter in code from the can when was that written in 1981 about 18 months before raiden literally went west this this is all fine avelia said but this cult thing has to be down the road yes we're with you there i answered but don't you think jacobs would have been incredibly stupid to have herself be the last person raided was seen with hell it'd be like setting herself up it is possible she was used or just thought he was going to be leaned on but it was murder instead yeah Amelia responded it's possible something else was going on but sometimes people do dumb things too but i don't know since she's not talking to us is she still alive yeah she's still alive and desmond wilson just lost that limo and a black car that was behind it ted asked that's what he says Avilio replied we heard jacobs had a kid by this milan bella chase in miami i said if he's this coke king do you think he'd set it up this way putting the mother of his kid in the middle of it i mean if the coke ripoff happened and he was the motive raiden could have been offered on a street corner without involving jacobs at all so why go through this elaborate setup a blessing may have been given but i'd say local on the actual setup that's a valid point gunderson agreed if there's big time organized crime or something they could have hit him anywhere but to use a woman and why here and not back in new york i cut in and why a disappearance who had something to gain by a disappearance rather than a straight out hit these are things we're looking at ahan said but sometimes logic goes out the window but without a body, there's no homicide investigation. Okay, but Raiden's secretary, this Lawson guy, says Raiden got calls that week saying he's got a big mouth and using the name Mike Scalise. Shit, no Bob guy's going to do that using an Italian name. We have no evidence of any organized crime involvement, Avelia agreed. Who did Raiden fear enough to ask Wilson to tail that limo that night? I asked. He wasn't afraid of Jacobs herself, Avelia said, but he didn't trust her local or Florida connections or Evans. Interesting. That canyon's pretty far out in God's country, Ted stated. Would Jacobs's friend would Jacobs's friends you mentioned know about it? I'd say that's a good possibility, Avelia answered. Well, that's pretty relevant, isn't it? Ted asked. We'd like to go there. Can you show us how to find it? Be glad to, Avelia replied and drew a detailed map for us. Was he shot there or dumped, I asked. There, but we can't go into why we know that. So they take a live guy 60 miles, even in the middle of the night. That's risky. Jeez. They didn't want him found, I said. What was the weapon, Ted wanted to know. Large gauge shotgun, said Ahan. We learned from sources in New York that Raiden would sometimes drop from sight for a couple of weeks without telling anyone where he was. We mentioned that if someone used that knowledge, then someone who knew Raiden or his quirks might have been involved. I also noted that the New York prison sources said Raiden was warned not to travel to Los Angeles. I've got that in writing, I said. That's a pretty good pipeline, Avelia answered. But you don't mean the actual killers knew his habits? 
Not necessarily, but whoever set it up may have been able to find that out. Maybe they already knew it, or maybe they had someone in Raiden's camp, and then the, a, disappearance, a disappearance would work for someone's advantage. Maybe for a reason beyond the fact that there is no homicide investigation without a body. At least, that's how we see it. But who the hell knows? Well, we'll... We'll have to wait and see, Avelio said. It was time to go. The meeting was cordial. The detectives as helpful as possible under the circumstances. Police like to take information, not give valuable facts, some of which were hidden in what wasn't said. And besides Manson too, we named another individual whose name we did know as a suspect and still another possible suspect. Ted rose, and I nodded at Georgiana, who, except for a few pleasant exchanges with the police, silently observed the session. We don't want to complicate this, Ted said at the door. Dope and Hollywood deals are legit motives, and our snuff film thing is probably secondary, but it could be the informants me meant to... But it could be the informants meant movies regardless. We're on exactly the same path. We just think your actual triggermen are cult connected and into an arrangement here like there was in New York. We appreciate the information, Avelia replied. And then we were gone. Emerging into the hot afternoon in downtown LA, Gunderson couldn't accompany us to the crime scene. He had a 3 p.m. flight to Denver to testify in a case there, but he said he'd be back to have dinner with us the next night. Then we can hit the canyon on Wednesday. How's that, he asked. We're leaving that morning and taking the coast highway up to Monterey, and Copco is inland, so we'll go up now, and you can get there whenever you can, okay? Ted consented, and we said goodbye. After changing into casual clothing back at the hotel, we found our way at Route 5 heading north. Beyond the San Fernando Valley, the terrain turned stark and craggy as we climbed into the mountains. Passing Magic Mountain and the picturesque Pyramid Lake, we finally rolled onto the isolated Hungry Valley Road exit. While Avelia's map in hand, we skirted the barrier at the end of Copco Canyon Road, bounced across the bush, and slowly turned onto the suddenly visible dirt path. Three-tenths of a mile in, we spied the tall, thick shrub across the dried creek bed and stopped the gray c citation wagon. The late-day sun was searing. There wasn't a hint of breeze, and Glenn Fisher's new hives stood but fifty yards from the car. The steady droning of thousands of bees was the only sound we heard. This was the eeriest place in the world, Georgiana whispered, and what a sight for a cult to meet. Yeah, I think... Yeah, I was thinking that too. We'll get out of here as fast as we can and try not to disturb those damned bees. The sickly sweet smell of death still lingered and we crossed the creek bed into the shrubs circling around it. We suddenly looked down at a large damp spot by the outer branches. It was where the body had festered for nearly a month. I wasn't expecting to see this, Georgiana slowly said. Yeah, I replied. After him for so long, and we finally met up like this in a barren inferno 3,000 miles from home. It's horrible. It's like he's still here, she said quietly, averting her eyes from the ground and staring apprehensively into the canyon where the droning bees hummed and winged a winged eulogy. Yes, still here. Only the dead can't die, I answered and turned away. Raiden's presence, now a very real emotion. Scanning the immediate area, I noticed a small bush a few feet to the right of where the body had been. Some of its stems were freshly clipped, 
The cops took something from here, I said, and dug into the branches. I came up with clumps of Raiden's brown hair. Here's how they knew he wasn't dumped. He got it at ground level right here, Georgiana cringed. For the next hour, ever mindful of the swarming bees, we searched the area, looking for the cult signs of which Vinny alerted me, or for other evidence. There were numerous weathered circular clay targets, mostly shattered, which we later established were no longer manufactured. We also found several duck pheasants, shotgun shell casings, target practice, I said, with shotguns, so Raiden got it with a shotgun in a place that was known by people who practiced with shotguns. Near our car, we found a broken taillight we later determined came from a 1974 Volkswagen. Maybe them, maybe not. But two cars bumped here not long ago. No rust or corrosion. Only somebody who knew this place could ever find, find it, Georgiana offered. They sure didn't come up in that limousine or just stumble into here from the highway right on both counts finally we had enough with the wafting scent of death the humming bee chorus and the desolation the canyon made us uneasy we took some final photos and dry and dusky dry and dusty drove back to marina del rey the next day we relaxed did some sightseeing and joined ted gunderson and his daughter for dinner at the marina Bob Duffy and I will go up to the canyon tomorrow, Ted reported over a tender steak. We work together now and then. He's good on these things, but you won't come? No more, I answered. It's Highway 1 for us, going back to Big Sur, as Johnny Rivers sang it. Maybe you guys will be luckier, although we did all right. You've got to see it for yourself to get the idea of what they went through to get in there. They knew exactly what they were they knew exactly where they were going. Wish you were coming, but f you but you folks are now on vacation. Yes, sir. We'll be in Monterey tomorrow, Stanford on Thursday and into San Francisco that night. Then R and R till Monday morning, or so I thought. This is your case, Georgiana admonished back at the hotel. I don't think it's fair to just take off and let them go up there alone tomorrow. But we've already saw it. They're good, and their own observations will be valuable. I wanted you to see Highway 1. It's a great drive, and besides, you were afraid of the place. We can check out take everything with us and get over to the coast farther up that's all they volunteered to help so i think you should go back i'll be fine it'll be four of us and ted has a gun nobody's going to okay okay i called gunderson at 9 a.m and by one o'clock we were back at the canyon the same strong scent the same stillness and the same droning bees greeted us. Christ, this place is creepy, said Duffy. The valley of death, Ted agreed. Duffy put his emotions aside and soon made an, appoint an important discovery. In a patch of grass on the north bank of the dry creek, near where we'd parked our cars, he reached down and came up with a shiny 12-gauge. A double lot buck shotgun shell. It was about 30 yards from where Raiden fell. It wasn't a typical target shell. It hadn't been there for long, and it wasn't a reload. It had been fired but once. Now, since Gunderson had managed to obtain a copy of the autopsy report, we could try to recreate the murder. The consensus was that Raiden was pulled from a car, struggled briefly, and with buttons torn from his vest and shirt, ran for his life through the creek bed. Once shot, fired from where Duffy found the shell, 
missed the fleeing millionaire in the dark, desperately climbing the south bank of the creek, Raiden sought the cover of the large fur-like shrub, but with his leather-soled Gucci loafers, he slipped on the sandy earth and fell on his back. One shoe landed beside him. Trying to get up again, he reached for a low branch, and his killer caught him just as he found it. He was shot in the back of the head, not the face, a, as widely reported, and fell back dead on the spot, left his hand still gasp grasping at the branch. On the basis of the evidence we had, we didn't include crime scene photos. We were responsibly certain Roy Raiden was slain in that manner. Even for him, it was a horrid way to die. We were about to leave when I found out it. We were about to leave when I found out it. On both excursions to the canyon, I had avoided crawling over the moist spot where Raiden lay to forage through the grass beneath the dense branches of the shrub he'd held while dying. I don't know why I finally decided to do it. I can only remember thinking I'd never be there again and didn't ever want to wonder about it back in New York. So I crawled. It was hidden in the grass near the base of the tangled shrub, about eight feet from the outer branches. It was sunk about two inches into the sandy soil, apparently the result of a wash. It was a King James Bible, and it was deliberately folded up, bent at the spine so that its left-hand pages were beneath those on the right. To ensure that it remained open to the intended passage, the front cover and the first few hundred pages had been torn off. Peering through the branches on hands and knees and parting the grass which covered it, I looked at it lying there. I saw in good condition Isaiah chapter 22 staring back at me. Nervously, I began to read it. It sounded like a description of Raiden's Death Canyon, the Valley of Vision, crying to the mountains, gathered together waters, ditch between two walls for, for the water, and there was more. Toss thee like a ball into a large country, and there thou shalt die, and behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. I was staring into the face of homicidal madness. Ted, G, Bob, somebody get the hell over here with the goddamned camera quick. What do you have, amigo? Ted called from the creek bed. Just a minute, just a minute. Backing out to reach the camera, I crept back in and took photos of the Bible, the grass around it, and then the shallow hole it had sunk into. Finally, I crawled from the dense foliage and, he'd, and held it aloft gingerly. The wash had packed cake dirt into it and damaged the spine. Now, why the hell do you suppose this little treasure was hidden under the same tree our victim was grabbing 60 miles out here in the middle of God-blasted nowhere? I tend to doubt it fell from a passing 747. There were congratulations all around. That damned valley, Vinny had told me, I said. He told me a long time ago, and he put it in a letter again. Look for a sign. You know what to look for. Damn, and here, I didn't want to come back to this stinking place. We'd b have been over in Santa Barbara by now. You know what this thing means? It confirms everything. And this on top of all the other years of building evidence on evidence. For all my years in this business, I'll tell you you're absolutely right. Gunderson beamed. We all make a good team, buddy. Fucking cops can't even do a thing. Fucking cops can't even do a thorough crime scene search. Yeah, but we all missed it too, Ted. We're about to leave now, and G and I 
were here on Monday and missed it. I just didn't want to grope through all that stuff. And I'm sure the cops didn't either. I'm just as guilty as them, maybe even worse, because I knew something might be here. Not quite, Dovey said. You did go in there. Screw the cops. God, I... God, I won't ever forget this one, he grinned. Goddamn reporter too, Ted laughed. Not even a bureau guy. That's why I'm able to be open-minded, I answered. Maybe we should keep looking around here. We might find Jimmy Hoffa. You FBI turkey sure couldn't. After a quick lunch at a small roadside restaurant a few miles north of the canyon in tiny Gorman, our group split up. Gunderson and Duffy drove south to L.A., and we began our delayed journey to Monterey. Suddenly, being thrown off schedule didn't matter. Isaiah 22, which we read carefully in the restaurant parking lot, seemed to describe a power struggle with someone casting out another. But whether there was any relevance to the message, we didn't know. I kept the Bible, wanting to run some tests on it in New York before sending it to L.A. police. But red blotches we thought might be blood stains would turn out to be dye, perhaps from a flower. The next morning, I called Avilia from a Mont Monterey motel room and told him of the discovery. He hadn't... He didn't know what to make of it. You've got four witnesses willing to testify if it's ever needed, Carlos. And like we said the other day, it doesn't impact the motives you're looking at. It just not so subtly suggests that your actual perps were part of this cult. Set up a 3,000 mile net has now been dropped over all the cases but that may mean more to us in New York than to you. Well, I can't deal with whether anybody's in a cult now. We told you that, Avelia said. No, but we can. At some point, the paths may meet. I'll send this to you in a couple of weeks, along with a shotgun shell and some photos, and I'm not going to publish anything now. There's too much to lose by that. Two hours later, we dropped in to see Sergeant Khan at the Santa Clara Sheriff's Department in downtown San Jose. As I took the prized Bible from a bag, chunks of dirt decorated the Sheriff's Conference table. Sorry about that, but this may be as close as we've all come to Mr. Manson the second. The alleged engineer of Arliss's murder, it appears he may still be very much in business. I then briefed the startled con on the developments in Los Angeles. Later, when the glow subsided, we pondered the implications of the Bible and the Raiden murder. They were frightening. While we visited the Stanford Church, drove down curling Lombard Street in San Francisco, toured Alcatraz, crossed the Golden Gate to shop in Sausalito, and celebrated with a Saturday night Chateaubriand dinner at Mark Hopkins Hotel, Ted Gunderson went right back to work in Los Angeles. We weren't confident the cult participated in the Raiden murder, but we didn't know who pulled the trigger or why it was done. Vinny, who may have been confused on the films in question, mentioned the Moskowitz tape as a partial motive. And then there was the alleged Coke ripoff of the Cotton Club movie deal. We were also specifically trying to identify Manson too, whom we strongly suspected had a hand in the murder. Initially, Ted Gunderson's job was to find suspects and see if they matched Manson 2's profile. Back in New York, I was to work on motive, and like the police, I examined the drug scene and the film arrangements, the two major events in Raiden's last months of life. Robert Evans, 52, was a movie giant, although it was said... The luster was tarnished after, after a 1981 conviction in New York for possession of several ounces of cocaine. 
Then too, recent Evans projects, such as Players and Popeye, had turned more stomachs than heads, but before that, Evans was a skyrocket at Paramount's head of production in the late 60s and early 70s. The native New Yorker and former actor had brought films such as Rosemary's Baby, Love Story, The Odd Couple, and The Godfather into the studio's fold. Seeking the individual credit he couldn't garner with the studio, Evans became an independent producer. Working again with Roman Polanski, he produced Chinatown, a highly, su a highly successful and widely acclaimed film which starred Jack Nicholson, Faye Dunway, Dunaway, and John Hut Huston. But then, after mixed reviews were sprinkled on his Black Sunday, a terrorism story, story filmed in Miami at Super Bowl X in 1976. The slide began. The Cotton Club, a gangster and music epic about Harlem's famous nightclub of the Roaring Twenties, was anointed as Evans returned from limbo and Evans desperately wanted to own the film. The whole inspiration is to own something, he told New York Magazine. Accordingly, Evans shunned the studio and searched for private investors. He said he backed out of a potential deal with billionaire Adnan Khashoggi. You mean that guy that was cut up into pieces at the Saudi Arabian embassy? Strange how he shows up in yet another book. Huh. Made a potential dip deal with billionaire Adnan Khashoggi because the, the Arab asked for 55% of the film. Then, in the autumn of 1982, Evans linked up with brothers Ed and Fred Domaney and their associate, Victor Saiha, the document, the Domin Domanis were sons of a Lebanese father who became a successful Las Vegas builder, and the brothers themselves built and operated the city's Tropicana Hotel at Ed Morocco Casino. Saya was a wealthy insurance executive from Denver. In January 1983, the Vegas contingent entered into a partnership arrangement with Evans after reading a Cotton Club script prepared by Godfather author Mario Puzo. Evans's choice for a leading man, Richard Gere, singer and longtime Evans advisor, respecting Silbert, a cognizant of Gere's box office appeal, Evan redid the script himself. To no one's satisfaction, so in early March, he enlisted Godfather director Francis Ford Coppola, now an independent filmmaker, to rewrite the Puzo Evans screenplay. On April 5th, Coppola finished his first draft, which Evans took to Las Vegas a week or two later. The, extent, the exact date is uncertain, but it was in mid-April in Vegas the Delmanis, who'd approved the original script, didn't like the rewrite. Significantly, although remained in the project, they suspended further financing, and Evans was already into early production in New York. Here, stories began conflicting. One version holds that only now did Elaine Jacobs introduce Raiden and Evans, who was delving deep into his own pockets to keep the Cotton Club in business. But another account, that of people connected to Raiden, alleges that Raiden and Evans actually met through Jacobs at least two months earlier. In February at La Cirque restaurant and began their dealings then. Jacobs, according to his account, was romantically involved with Evans and also was helping him raise funds for the Cotton Club. If so, was Evans, by linking up with Raiden, double-dealing on the Las Vegas investors? Maybe not, 
because the rate and arrangement might have included a percentage of Evans's shares only, and also was structured to encompass a studio in Puerto Rico and pre-production financing of two subsequent films, one of which was to be Jake II, the sequel of Chinatown. That film apparently would be made minus Roman Polanski, who skipped the United States after a late 1979 conviction for a close encounter of the first kind with a 13-year-old girl, who he raped in the ass. Vigorously. Regardless, Evans maintained that he barely knew Elaine Jacobs, telling New York Magazine's Michael DeLay, if I knew who she really was, I would have run out of town. But Carol Johnson, a Raiden friend who introduced the Long Island millionaire to Jacobs in early January 1983, told another story. Johnson said Jacobs revealed that she and Evans planned to marry and go into business together. There, all, there also are suggestions from two sources that Raiden and Evans knew each other in the New York in New York several years before Jacobs brought them together in L.A. Evans and Raiden signed that 45-45-10 contract on April 26, 1983, with Jose Alagria representing Puerto Rican government interests assigned to s the smaller figure. It was Raiden who brought banker Alagria into the project after Alagria nego negotiated to obtain $35 million from his government to fund the deal. And it was Alagria who said he later told Raiden that Evans would one day realize he'd lost control of his own enterprise. Now Raiden's world began to tilt on its axis. In early April, before the movie contract was signed, Elaine Jacobs, who'd been promised a $50,000 finder's fee by Raiden, accused him of having a hand in the theft of $1 million in cocaine and cash from her Sherman Oaks, California home. Raiden's secretary, Jonathan Lawson, and a woman friend of Raiden, Anna Montenegro, both said they heard Jacobs accuse Raiden of urging her own runner, Tally Rogers, to pull off the job. Lawson said he was present in the Raiden's Regency suite when Jacobs made the charges into the millionaire's face in early April. Montenegro, who knew Jacobs before Raiden did, said she was at Jacobs' home the day before Raiden disappeared and heard her make the same accusation to male acquaintances. Montenegro described as bodyguards, one of whom would soon emerge as an important figure in our investigation. Jacobs supposedly believed Raiden used Rogers to engineer the heist because Raiden was strapped for cash. According to Lawson, the sergeant, according to Lawson and Sergeant Carlos Avila, Raiden was indeed buying coke from Rogers as much as one thousand dollars worth per week between January and April 1983. However, Raiden paid Rogers with personal checks made out to Elaine Jacobs, some of which the police obtained, and said Lawson Raiden stopped payment on a four thousand dollar April check after Jacobs accused him of the Tally Rogers conspiracy, which Raiden vehemently denied. Rogers disappeared at the time, and police believed he set sail for the Midwest. Avelia did not con Avelia is not convinced the theft itself actually occurred. Others believe it did. Beyond Raiden's alleged dope difficulties with Jacobs, there was another problem. She desired more than the $50,000 finder's fee Raiden promised for putting him and Evans together on the Cotton Club. She wanted a percentage of the entire package, and she wanted it from Raiden's cut, not Evans. Here, too, ambiguity reigns. Anna Montenegro reportedly told Raiden that Jacobs already had been dealt a share of the three-way arrangement without Raiden's knowledge. If so, the points certainly weren't Raiden's or Jose Alagria's. Like 
careening locomotives rushing headlong on the same track. Another raid in Jacobs confrontation. This one over the Cotton Club occurred in Evans's Manhattan townhouse on May 5, 1983, eight days before Raiden's disappearance. At that moment, the Las Vegas financing was suspended and Raiden Evans and Alagria were signed at 45-45-10. Raiden and Alagria had come to Evans's East Coast abode to hammer out the final details of their agreement arrangement. And then, to Raiden's surprise, Elaine Jacobs arrived from California. It was an interesting coincidence. She and Raiden, they argued wildly over her percentage demanded demand, while a blase Evans lingered upstairs in the library, chagrined. Raiden charged up the stairs to talk to Evans. According to both Alagria and Evans, Evans, for unfathomable reasons, urged Raiden to give in to Jacobs, but not for Roy Raiden. With Alagria in tow, he stormed from the townhouse. Outside Alagria told Newsday's Steve Wick, Raiden said he believed drug money was involved in the Cotton Club. Within days of the Manhattan on the Rocks episode, Alagria said he was Alagria said he received phone calls from Evans, Raiden, and Miami lawyer Frank Diaz, who said he represented both Jacobs and Evans. The messengers the messages were all the same. Evans was offering Raiden two million dollars to buy him out of the deal. Alagria said Evans encouraged him to persuade Raiden to accept the buyout and then to deal with him, but Raiden wouldn't budge. Alagria found Evans's comments fascinating. Not a week before, Alagria said, Evans had been in financial straits, saying he couldn't afford to post a performance bond required by the Puerto Rican government before it would construct a studio there it was part of the agreement so where did Evans suddenly find two million dollars throughout this period Evans continued his efforts to develop an acceptable cotton club script the Las Vegas investors were still on hold the Puerto Rican money had yet to change hands and technicians support People and others were at work in Astoria Studios in Queens where the film would be shot. The bills were piling up and Evans still didn't have a workable screenplay for all his important project. For his all-important project, Raiden, meanwhile, had but a day to simmer before flying back to L.A. where he signed into the Regency on Saturday, May 7th, Raiden Confidants in New York had warned him not to return to California. Vinny's prison letter to me had been right on target. Raiden went west to attend the bar mitzvah of Adam Buttons, son of entertainer actor Red Buttons. In a remarkably ir irony, Buttons would deliver Raiden's eulogy and say, he had the devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, and was in a perpetual tug of war. In L.A., Raiden also hoped to placate J Jacobs while not surrendering to her demands, and to iron out this now precarious movie deal, and it indeed was precarious. On Tuesday, May 10th, Lawson said he overheard an Evans phone call to Raiden during which Evans again offered to buy out Raiden's share. And again, Raiden refused, insisting he wasn't relinquishing his 45%. Now, two anonymous warnings were telephoned to the Regency suite by someone attempting to leave the impression he was mafia-connected. Time was running out for Roy Raiden. On Thursday, May 12th, Elaine Jacobs called the Regency and made arrangements to meet Raiden for dinner the following evening. Anna Montenegro later arrived at the suite in a fearful state of mind. Visibly upset, she told Raiden and Lawson she, that she'd been seen to Jacobs. Visibly upset, she told Raiden and Lawson that she'd been seen 
to Jacobs's house, and Jacobs was railing about the alleged drug cash theft to her bodyguards. And so the stage was set for Friday the 13th of May. As previously noted, Jacobs called for Raiden that evening in a limousine. The car had been rented without a driver, and extra money paid for that variation from the, no from the norm. With Demon Wilson allegedly waiting outside the Regency with a registered gun in a shoulder holster, Raiden and Jacobs left for La Scala restaurant, with which the nervous Raiden selected because its layout and popularity offered a secure setting to resolve matters with Jacobs. As the limo drove from the Regency, another black car, apparently a Cadillac, also pulled out behind it, with Wilson bringing up the car. With Wilson bringing up the rear, he said, the lead cars swung onto Fairfax and then turned on Sunset Boulevard. There, Wilson said both cars sped through a pair of red lights before turning left on Highland, leaving him lost in traffic. The cars were headed north. In the direction of Sherman Oaks and Route 5, Wilson then went to La Scala, waited, and was reached there by Lawson at 11.30 p.m. He told Lawson he'd lost the limo and the follow car in traffic. Lawson said he didn't locate Wilson again for two days. He eventually found him at a Marina Del Rey condominium where he'd gone to hide, fearful of what he'd seen. But if Wilson was so petrified by what he'd witnessed involving his close friend Raiden, why didn't he phone Lawson when Raiden failed to appear at La Scala? Why did Lawson instead have to find him, both in La Scala and again two days later? Wilson knew Raiden was concerned for his safety, according to Lawson. The prearranged plan for Wilson would to follow the limo and observe Raiden from another table in the restaurant. Then Raiden was either to come back to the Regency with Wilson or to call Lawson if the plan was changed. Ted Gunderson learned that an exhausted Lawson instructed the Regency desk clerk to phone him in case he inadvertently fell asleep if Raiden didn't return by 11 p.m. Wilson had been in Raiden's suite armed at 6 p.m. before eventually going downstairs to assume a position outside the hotel. It was about 8.45 when Raiden left with Jacobs. Lawson watched from the hotel lobby as the limo pulled away, and he also noticed another car pull out behind it. He didn't see Wilson's car, but Wilson may have been parked out of Lawson's line of vision. Shortly after Raiden's body was found, Desmond Wilson, whom Lawson said Raiden sometimes inexplic inexplicably dropped from sight with left Hollywood and became a traveling evangelist, today outside of acknowledging his former drug addiction problem, he refuses to speak to the press about his prior years in the entertainment business. A week before I left for Los Angeles in July 1983, a prison note I received from Vinny contained a reference <sighs> to bodyguards other than Jacobs. Its context was revealed to sheriff's investigators at that time. Meanwhile, on Friday night, the 13th of May, Jacobs later kept a prearranged social engagement at the apartment of an attorney Evans said she also called him during the evening to say she and Raiden had argued. This was the same story she told Lawson who located her in Florida several days later. Incidentally, Jacobs's young son and maid were flown to Miami shortly before Raiden's disappearance. In fact, Gunderson discovered that Jacobs put her house at 3862 Sherwood Place in suburban Sherman Oaks on the market on May 12th, the day before Raiden vanished. And a few weeks later, before the body was found, a Lancer's moving van removed furnishing from the home. 
Jacobs, prior to May 12th, also spoke to a neighbor about her future plans. She said she was going to New York to be a producer or director. <sighs> the neighbor told Gunderson. The Cotton, the Cotton Club would indeed be filming in New York, but where did Jacobs ever get the idea she was going to be a producer? Certainly not from Raiden or Jose Alagria. Subsequently detoured from the stages of Astoria Studios, Jacobs apparently flew to Miami in the early morning hours of May 14th, shortly after Raiden's aborted supper. When Lawson found her there, she delivered conflicting versions of what happened, denying she knew whether Raiden was first claimed. They'd argued, and, sh and he left the limo on Sunset Boulevard. Lawson challenged her, saying the limo hadn't stopped on Sunset. She then said she... She said she then said she, oh my god she then said it was she not Raiden who left the car in the meantime Robert Evans went about the business of polishing an acceptable Cotton Club script apparently resigned to the fact that his partner was among the missing but Evans before Raiden's disappearance became public. Lawson said Evans neither called back to see if Raiden had re reconsidered his $2 million buyout offer of Tuesday, May 10th, and even after Raiden's vanishing act reached the media, Lawson reportedly didn't... Lawson reportedly... Uh, Lawson reported he didn't hear from Evans then either. But Bob Evans was busy. He had it in mind to persuade the Las Vegas investors to lift their month-long suspension, suspension of funds and resume financing Bob Evans' film. While Roy Raiden went to Caswell Canyon, Bob Evans went to Napa, California, north of San Francisco. There, for a period of 10 days commencing Sunday, May 15th, according to New York Magazine, Evans labored in solitude with other Cotton Club principals and the estate of Francis Ford Coppola. Also in attendance were Richard Gere, actor-dancer Maurice Hines, and Marilyn Matthews, a black actress Evans met several months earlier in New York. Matthews viewed the Cotton Club as an important employment opportunity for black performers. Therefore, New York reported she was troubling when... About a week before the Napa meeting, Evans told her the Cotton Club wouldn't be made unless Coppola rewrote the script in two weeks. Why Evans allegedly made this comment is curious, because Alagria said the Puerto Rican government was preparing to announce the Evans rating agreement at a press conference which was to be scheduled soon. Regardless, on May 15th, the clean gathered the clan gathered at Napa night and day. They worked in seclusion, and by May 25th, a script approved by both Evans and the recalcitrant Richard Gere was hammered out. The following weekend, May 27th through 28th, Evans reportedly flew to Las Vegas with the rewritten screenplay. At first, the Domanis and Saya were still displeased, but the next day they agreed to resume financing the film. An ecstatic Evans could now proceed into full production. About 12 days later, on June 10th, beekeeper Glenn Fisher finally located the missing Roy Raiden in desolate Caswell Canyon. If not for Fisher, Raiden might have decayed uncovered... Raiden might have decayed undiscovered for another six months or more. The, clot, the Cotton Club hit the theaters 18 months after Fisher's find in December 1984 and was a critical box office failure. Elaine Jacobs hired an attorney who refused to allow the police to question her, which was her constitutional right. 
By early 1987, she was remarried and dividing her time between Miami and Colombia. Milan Bella Chase was said to be leaving in Colombia and operating a casino there. Frank Diaz, the Miami attorney, who said he represented both Jacobs and Evans on the film de deal with Raiden, told Newsday that he met Evans through Jacobs, adding that Jacobs sought his help in raising funds for the film. Diaz said he was going to kick in one and a half million dollars. Diaz himself is off somewhere. The attorney who frequently defended Colombian drug suspects was due in a Miami court in June 1985 to respond to obstruction of justice and fraud charges he was facing on matters not related to Raiden. But the day before his scheduled court appearance, Diaz was kidnapped by two men described as gun-wielding Colombians. His exposure to Hollywood and the shoot 'em up Cotton Club project may have affected Diaz. Authorities believe he might have staged his own abduction. Robert Evans, whom Diaz termed a friend, is <sighs> Robert Evans, whom Diaz termed a friend in his interview with Newsday was questioned for several hours about Raiden's case by Sheriff's Homicide Investigators in L.A., according to Sergeant Avila. Evans acknowledged knowing Jacobs, labeling her a casual acquaintance, and also confirmed knowing Roy Raiden. Evans denied having any information about what happened to Raiden. As the producer downplayed his relationship with Jacobs, he similarly categorized his association with Raiden as inconsequential, but Avelia noted that the signed multi-million dollar contract between the two alleviated their interaction from the realm of the superficial. As of 1987, Evans was back working for Paramount. Finally, Raiden secretary Jonathan Lawson adios America in fear of his life, with police concurrence and is now living secretly in Europe, apparently Lawson wasn't overreacting. He said that he was with Jacobs in her grade in suite. That final night, she shrugged to Lawson that he drive to her house and return with some cocaine she'd stashed there. Jacobs, Lawson said, told him they could all enjoy the drugs when she and Raiden returned. From La Scala, fearing the setup, Lawson said he remembered the body guards Anna Montenegro said were at Jacobs' house the day before, or an attempt to separate him from Raiden. Lawson declined the offer. In late 1986, Sergeant Carlos Avilia broad brushed the status of the case until it is solved. Everyone connected to it remains under scrutiny, which was another way of saying no one has been exonerated. I believe Roy Raiden's murder was intended to serve the purpose of more than one master, whoever they may be. But beyond the immediate why of Roy Raiden's murder lurked the question of who the actual killers were. Gunderson and I searched for the cult connections and the inquiry length was lengthy. Concurrently, we sought to learn if the mysterious Manson II was involved. Oh, man. Simply put, we believe that Whoever ordered the murder was acquainted with someone, perhaps Manson too, who was aligned with the L.A. headquarters of the Son of Sam Umbrella Cult. For, what a, for want of a better word, we believed a contract to kill Roy Raiden was taken by these cult elements. We thought the alliance mirrored that in New York... Curiously, this type of arrangement would also match one alleged to have occurred in the Manson case, which happened in the Raiden scenario's backyard. 
Berkowitz, Vinny said, revealed that Manson too claimed the original Charles Manson volunteered to commit the Tate murders, at least for someone else, and that a very real motive beyond Helter Skelter existed somewhere in the labyrinth of that investigation. The potential cross connections were compelling. The Bible and the canyon clearly signaled a cult connection to the raid and killing, an obvious conclusion strongly bolstered by what we'd previously learned about Raiden's life in New York. Effectively, the Bible's presence was a calling card, a sign of satanic triumph. I and Queens DA John Santucci had heard nearly two years earlier that certain symbols were usually left at the Sam cult crimes. The Bible was one, a mockery of Christianity when put to that use. Cult leaders may have been angry with Raiden over some issue which involved the Moskowitz tape, and Vinny's leak to us may have rendered Raiden expendable. If that was so, the cult hierarchy wouldn't have refused the assignment. In other words, several motive cult related and others may well have converged. Gunderson and I with the drug mo movie slant of the police investigation, but we were just as certain of cult connivance somewhere. Almost certainly one of the actual killers was cult connected, and perhaps someone higher up the ladder as well. If we could tie a raid and shooting suspect to the days of Sharon Tate at Al, we believe that he could be Manson too, would strengthen appreciably. We'd be looking to see if the suspect matched the physical description of Manson too that Benny provided, which we already knew was identical to to that of an individual observed at the Christine Freund murder scene in New York. Once into the original Manson circle, especially that of the social sect, we'd also look for someone else who, perhaps having known Manson too from the late 60s, was also a player in the 1983 raiding case. In other words, we plan to go down and back up the ladder of time, looking for parallels in the lives of at least two particular people. The odds against us were immeasurable, but if we couldn't find and identify Manson too, then perhaps we'd find suggestions of another association of long-standing be between people connected to the raiding case. That too would be of great significance to the investigation, but who were the Raiden's shooting, su shooting suspects? The police weren't cooperative, but well before I learned of Anna Montgomery's statement about the bodyguards as Jacobs's house the night before Raiden vanished, Gunderson's own investigation unearthed a fascinating lead. His name is Phil, but I don't have the last name, Ted told me, but he's directly affiliated with Jacobs as has been at her house a lot. I believe it was her right there the night before Raiden got it, and he was driving a black caddy, the same kind of car that followed the limo. Do you have a description of this guy? Ted indeed did, and incredibly, the, script, the description closely approximated the one Vinny provided of Manson, too. Gunderson didn't have Phil's last name, so I phoned Willie Ahan to ask him about it and to see if the police themselves had located the black Cadillac. The date was October 6th, 1983. We know about Phil, Willie said. He's very much a part of the Jacobs crowd, but I can't give you his name. We're now trying to obtain warrants on two black cars. One is his. Gunderson had struck pay dirt. I pressed hard for Phil's last name, but was unsuccessful. And then for a moment, it didn't matter. Willie Ahan told me he was ill and the prognosis wasn't encouraging. I hung up saddened and I never did get to speak to Willie Ahan again. Within months, the personable homicide investigator died. It wasn't until June 6, 1984 that Carlos Avila released Phil's last name to me. After being stalled for eight months, our inquiry resumed. Gunderson, along with investigator Judy Hansen, journalist Dee Brown, and Dave 
Balsiger and others, including law enforcement contacts, assisted the probe, which I coordinated daily out of New York. As time passed, a remarkable picture of Phil developed. Phil, whom I will assign the last name Benson, had an arrest record. One of those incidents involved possession of a handgun, which he threatened to use in an argument with another man. Significantly, Benson was also arrested in the same L.A. suburb. At the same time, Vinny said Manson, it, Manson too was in town. Benson also frequented another suburb where Vinny said the cult maintained its headquarters. So we now had a man directly connected to the raiding case who matched this description of Manson too, used handguns in a menacing manner, and was right in and was in the right town at the right time. In an attempt to connect Benson to Caswell Canyon, I asked Avelia if Benson was familiar with he or somebody else, a friend knew about it, Avelia said. Who, no, would that friend happen to have been a target shooter? Yes, a shooter. Do you think Berkowitz was there the night Raiden was killed? He quite possibly was there. If he wasn't there himself, I'm certain he had a hand in the operation. I said, and Avelia offered no denial. Benson was a suspect, but there was still much more to be learned. We next established that Benson had been a regular visitor to Miami, home of people tied to the raiding case. He also traveled to Houston City of 44 revolver purchase and authorities said a metrop metropolis with a known population of satanic cultists and rituals. Moreover, in 1979, Berkowitz referenced a restaurant in Houston in the context of occult activities. He named a particular establishment, one that was directly t uh, tied to OTO activities in New York. Benson, we learned, was affiliated with another Houston establishment that was operated to cater to those with occult interests. Bit by bit, the case against Benson was building, and then we put him in, and then we put him right into the middle of the Charles Manson social sect. Because of the sensitivities of an open investigation, the details provided here will of necessity be somewhat oblique. Benson, Benson, sources said, and we independently confirmed, was a friend of Mama Cass Elliot, the singer with the Mamas and the Papas rock group. After the group split in the late 60s, Cass went on to a successful career as a solo artist before being found dead in a London hotel room in 1974, apparently of natural causes. But Benson had known Case in Los Angeles in 1968 through 72 time frame when, out of loneliness and vulnerability, much of which was due to her extreme overweight condition, she began to collect an unsavory entourage of hang hanger ons and dope dealers and entertain them in her home off of Woodstock Road in the Hollywood Hills near Mul Mulholland Drive. Of Cass's associates, John Phillips, lead singer of the Mamas and the Papas, wrote in his 1986, 1986 book, Papa John, at home Cass was surrounded by losers and cruel users. They were just hustlers, music industry leeches. If she came to visit us, she came alone without her retinue. They were sometimes drugged out, belligerent dope dealers in leather with weapons, chains, and cycles. They were like muggers. Phillips went on. They were part of a clique that hung around Cass in the hills or around the house that Terry Melcher sublet on Roman Polanski on Celio Drive in Bel Air. Among them were Jay Sebring, who was a popular hairdresser to the stars, and Woltek Frykowski, a longtime friend of Roman's from Poland, and the same boyfriend of Cass's 
who had been sought by Scotland Yard on, suspicious, on suspicion of drug smuggling, Sebring, 35, and Frank Kowski, 32, would be among those slain by Charles Manson's hordes shortly after midnight on Saturday, August 9, 1969, in the Tate Polanski home at 10050 Celio Drive in Benedict Canyon. This was... Composition. This was the composition of the smaller Cass Elliott circle in that summer of 1969, and in it, remarkably, was Phil Benson. Primarily, thought Frykowski, the Cass Elliott group was linked to the extended Roman Polanski circle, which included Phillips and his wife, singer actress Michelle Phillips, actor Warren Betty, Robert Evans. Pro- Production designer and Evans's confidant Richard Slybert, and actor Jack Nicholson and others. Additionally, Frykowski and his girlfriend, coffee heiress Abigail Gibby Folger, 25, lived across the street from Mama Cass and knew her well along with some of her retinue. As Phillips phrased it, one of Mama Cass's boyfriends picked Dawson, whose father worked for the U.S. State Department, even lived in the Frykowski Folger home in the summer of 1969. While Frykowski and Folger house sat for the Polanskis on Celio Drive, the climate was certainly favorable for Raiden, suspect Benson to know Frykowski and Folger and others in the circle, but did he? He definitely knew Gibby Folger, a Los Angeles contact said. I knew both of them then and saw them together at lunch in a restaurant in Newport Beach with a couple of other people not long before the murders. I confirmed that account by finding a person who shared the Benson Folger table that day. I was with them on that occasion, said the source, who was an undercover operative for the FBI. The source wasn't an FBI agent, but was recruited by the Bureau in the late 60s to infiltrate the anti-war and drug scene in California. Folger knew Benson, he said simply. This was explosive information. Benson knew one of the Tate victims, and Berkowitz had said Manson, too, told the New York group that a real motive existed for the murders. Benson was in a position to know that Frykowski was a narcotics user, as was J. Sebring. Mescaline, LSD, cocaine, and marijuana were among their sampled favorites. Author Ed Sanders reported that a man named Joel Rostell, murdered in New York in late 1970, made coke and mescaline delivery to Sebring on Celio Drive on the night of the murders. Rostell was the boyfriend of a Mrs. Cuffery, an employee of Sebring's, who told Sanders about the visit. Frykowski was said to have been deeper into the drug scene than Sebring, to the extent of being closely allied with Mama Cass's crowd and doing some dealing for and with them, an artist friend of Frykowski's told police that Frykowski was offered an opportunity to wholesale the drug MDA and amphetamine in the LA area and that friction later developed between him and dealers. By our own sources confirmed this arrangement, beyond question, the dope distributors were part of Mama Cass's unsavory group of associates, and they also and they were also regular visitors of one zero zero five zero Celio Drive where Frykowski entertained them while Polanski and Sharon Tate were abroad from March nineteen sixty nine until Tate returned alone on july twentieth. Pregnant, she arrived in Los Angeles to prepare for the birth of her child. Polanski was scheduled to fly back on August 12th. One of Mama Cass's dope-affiliated friends admitted to police that he was at Celio Drive twice during the week of the murders. The last time on August 7th, barely 30 hours before the slaughter, Raiden's, so Raiden's suspect 
Bill Benson appeared in this galaxy of stars as a friend of Mama Cass and an associate of Abigail Folger. And even if Benson turned out not to be Manson too, we were now certain he was at least acquainted with the dangerous killer because... Beyond his social links to Celio Drive, we also put Benson into the heart of the L.A. cult scene. The Los Angeles occult underground was, and remains, a maze of shadowy connections and subterranean byplay. As in New York, there are regular trade-offs with narcotics traffickers and recent exposure of ritualistic child abuse cases in Southern California has brought to the surface indications of links between the satanic subculture and child pornography. There are numerous cult factions still operating in Los Angeles. In 1987, authorities familiar with the network said pockets of druids, OTO, former process elements, and many others slithered beneath the landscapes, as did the Chingon cult, whose current existence there was noted by two law enforcement sources and two former Satanists themselves. These revelations confirmed the Vinnie Danny Berkowitz information, which held that the Sam's cult, the Sam cult's overall headquarters was located in the L.A. environs. And where did Raiden Manson II suspect Phil Benson fit in? From four different sources, we learned of his occult ties, which retained constant, which remained constant in 1987. Investigator Judy Hansen, working on an unrelated matter, jotted down his license plate number several times while probing a case in 1982. Benson, she said, occasionally visited the home of a man known to be a member of a Los Angeles satanic coven. This other guy used to get used to go out late at night dressed totally in black like the old process costume and he had occult symbols in his home, Hansen reported. A neighbor of his told me that he belonged to a cult and was having some kind of difficulty with its leaders while working this other case, which didn't involve a cult at all. I wrote down plate numbers of this individual's visitors, and Benson's car showed up a few times. This was more than a year before Roy Raiden disappeared. Two other Los Angeles contacts also linked Benson to cult activity. One of them was involved in the occult, and the other, while no part of the satanic movement knew Benson's connections to it and correctly identified his daylight line of business. Another informant who knew Benson personally linked him to a private social club, which was specifically formed to cater to mystical interests. Whether backroom activities there said to include dope dealings and sadomasochistic sex were those of the cult per se, we didn't know. But since the club also had a branch in Houston, we believed we had a link to the headquarters of the SAM group. If not active behind the walls of the club itself, we strongly suspected that club organizers were part of the SAM operation. Benson was a club member, and the informant identified his photo and said Benson was instrumental in obtaining occult paraphernalia for the operation. Southern California police sources stated that Benson was a honcho in the club. One major piece of the puzzle was put in place by both the FBI inform informant and another source. The federal contact placed Benson in the San Francisco area during the time period when Arliss Perry was murdered. The other source said he and a couple of his friends used to like to go up to the Stanford... You... the. He and a couple of his friends used to like to go up to Stanford and hang around the campus occasionally. But there was more. A Los Angeles man who once worked with Benson said there was a rumor talk among the guys that he'd done a murder. I'd had my own contacts in law enforcement, including someone in the intelligence community and the federal government. I asked if he'd ever heard of Benson. He said, Phil Benson? 
we have it that he did a hit in Son of Sam. Los Angeles police sources subsequently confirmed in 1987 that information in their possession held that Benson was a member of some kind of hit squad. Gunderson and I knew what kind of hit squad it was. We also learned that Benson was considered a prime suspect in the Raiden case. That information didn't emanate from Sergeant Carlos Avelia, who had resisted the apparent cult link to the Raiden murder, perhaps because the official crime scene search failed to uncover the Bible and shotgun shells because we alone traced Benson back to the Manson days. Regardless, by early 1987, Avelia had assumed a new assignment in the sheriff's office and other investigators were appointed to monitor the Raiden case, which remained open. Ted Gunderson and I lack the authority to pursue Benson any further, but all the information on him, including the names of the sources who provided it, was turned over to the Queen's District Attorney's Office in early 1987. Likewise, reports were forwarded to Santa Clara Sheriff's detectives in charge of the Arliss Perry case and to the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, during the investigation, we were able to learn the identities of several of Benson's close companions in Southern California, and the sources believe these men are part of the Sam Chingon operation. Those names were also provided to law enforcement, and we were now sure that we knew who was involved in the murder of Roy Raiden and what their connections were. Our trick our trip back through time had proved to be an enlightening journey that, of course, left the matter of Charles Manson himself. The questions were two. Was Manson too telling the truth when he told the New York group that Charles Manson volunteered to kill Tate victims for real motives beyond the nightmarish process like Armageddon Helter Skelter? And if so, who was Manson working for? But the investigation wouldn't tarry too long in the past. At the same time the Tate inquiry was underway, the Roy Raiden cult probe was ready to leap back across the country to New York in 1985 in a vicious, conclusive manner. There were still more murders on the menu. And that's it for today.